check this out. On April 26th of this year, I conducted an interview with two members of the California wing of the Civil Air Patrol. In fact, it was our first in-studio interview since the COVID pandemic broke out over a year ago. Then just three days later, I received an email from Cadet Second Lieutenant Hunter Hall, who is a Civil Air Patrol cadet, aspiring fighter pilot. He says, quote, I wonder if you would be willing to make an episode on the Civil Air Patrol. It could be interesting for both youth and adult fans. The Civil Air Patrol has shown me what military life is like, taught me about leadership and working hard, given me amazing, unique opportunities, and given me more drive to become a fighter pilot. I hope it is possible to make an episode about the Civil Air Patrol, and I would love to help anywhere I can. Well, you just did, Cadet Second Lieutenant Hall, because that's as good an intro to this important organization and today's episode as I could possibly ask for. So, let's do it. Welcome aboard, everybody. Cat 4733. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. I am your host, Jello, and this is episode 112. That's right. We're talking about the Civil Air Patrol. Now, look, you know, these aren't Mach 2 fighters or the latest GPS-guided weapons we're talking about here, but the Civil Air Patrol, as we just heard from Cadet Second Lieutenant Hall, it's a really incredible organization doing great work, not just for aspiring young military aviators, but for our entire nation. In fact, one of our past guests was in the Civil Air Patrol and went on to a career piloting F-18s in the Marine Corps. You remember Darren Chung from episode 26 on the MAGTAF? Well, he returned to help out with episode 60 on the MiG-29 Fulcrum, and he's back again to land a hand today. How's it going, Wang? I'm doing great, Jello. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's good to have you back. It's been forever. How'd you do through, uh, golly, did we even talk in COVID's madness last year? How'd you make through that, and how are you doing now? It's great to be back. Thanks. Yeah, we survived COVID okay. We're up here in the Pacific Northwest, kind of live out in the country, so we don't have to worry about living on top of neighbors and things like that. We were able to Mm -hmm. quarantine pretty well. It's been nice in the last few weeks or so. The kids just started going back to in-person learning, so it's nice starting to return to a normal or or maybe this is a new normal. (laughs) Work's been good. I've actually been flying a fair amount. Regionals, I think, recovered from the COVID stuff uh, probably a little bit faster than mainline. I mean, you could probably speak to that, but flying has been good and still loving it up here. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I have not flown since last October, but as I mentioned on a previous episode, I got a reprieve from my airline. Don't have to commute from San Diego to New York, but I get to go back to my old equipment in LA and just waiting on the refresher training. But yeah, the regionals got me up here to Southern Oregon. I'm up visiting my mother for Mother's Day and hopefully uh, groups like you will get me home. Excellent. Anyway, it's good to have you back. Hey, tell you what though, Wang, it's, if you'll give me a minute, it's been a little while since I've chatted with the listeners because, man, we just had a lot of different crazy episodes over the last few weeks. And we go all the way back to episode 109 on DARPA in mid-April is when I last talked to folks. That was a really great show with Animal. And then uh, at the end of April, we had Boat on the Avril Lancaster, which was well-received. And then, of course, last week, we went straight to the interview on the F-111 on episode 111, and the feedback with the two Australian guests was really great as well. Now, some folks did write in to say, hey, you forgot to point out that the F-111 had brief cameos in a few 80s movies, such as Red Dawn and James Bond's Octopussy, which is true. You know, we're always going to miss something here and there. And then others have asked if we'd have a follow-on episode to cover some of the U.S. subtleties of the EF and the FB 111s. You know, I'm not sure about that, but we certainly won't rule it out. We're always looking for good content and good guests. In other announcements, Wang, we've had a lot of other great content over the past month on our Facebook page, including a YouTube replay of a panel I moderated on how technological advancements are affecting the future of air combat training. Let's see what else. We posted a blog on our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com, musing about fighter pilot stereotypes. And we even had a new shirt last week to accompany the F-111 episode, a F-111 shirt. And it's on our merch page also there on fighterpilotpodcast.com. So we always have a lot going on. Be sure to jump in and check it out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, 
pretty much everywhere. And oh yeah, on Patreon, we've had a lot of exclusive happy hour discussions, including with Ward Carroll recently and uh, live Zoom calls with past guests. We're just having a lot of fun. So jump right in and be a part of the Fighter Pilot Podcast community. I remember back, uh, oh gosh, it's been more than a few years ago. I mean, back when the EF-111 was still flying, we had multiple tactical electronic warfare platforms. And really the last tactical electronic warfare platform was probably the Prowler. And we're not seeing that anymore replaced by the EA-18 uh, Growler. But tactical electronic warfare is a huge issue. You you know it better than I do, certainly being an air wing guy. You don't really go anywhere without somebody uh, working the electronic spectrum. So it'll be interesting to hear uh, about the subtleties uh, between the EF and the FB-111. That'll be cool. Yeah, hopefully we can circle back to that. No, you're absolutely right. It kind of surprises me, as we've talked about before. The Air Force is kind of out of that business a little bit right now. Uh, and so is the Marine Corps, although the EA-18, as you said, is helping out both. And so, yeah, it'd be interesting to see. And it would be fun to take a, a walk back on the EF-111 Raven and learn a little bit about that. It's got a really interesting look. The uh, vertical stabilizer looks a lot like the one on the Prowler, you know, with that big antenna built in. So, right, good stuff. Hey, Wang, the other result of the last couple episodes is we haven't answered any listener questions. I got a couple here. You willing to help out? Let's do this. All right, cool. Let's start from the email from Adam Diaz. Diaz? Sorry, Adam. Uh, He says, in the F-15 episode, you asked Stretch and Spider-Man if they logged any, quote, green ink. I was wondering if you could go into the different inks you use in the Navy to log the different types of hours, as well as ask any previous Army and Air Force guests to see how they log their hours. So, Wang, I did ask a couple folks, but before we do, Navy and Marine Corps are the same. Do you remember the different colors we used in our physical logbooks? Red and black was what I had in mind. And I know that some services use like red for nighttime, but I mean, my red ink is combat time and everything else is all in black ink. Oh, wow. I wouldn't put it past my Marine Corps ops clerks to, you know, maybe do something a little bit different just because. <laughs> But um, I only have two colors of ink in my logbook, and that's uh, black and red. Okay. Well, being the Marine Corps, I'm surprised it wasn't red and green. But at least in the Navy and the squadrons I was in, we used red for night, like you said. Or actually, you said you used red for combat. That's interesting. We used green for combat, red for night. We used blue for NVG and black for pretty much everything else. But I did talk to uh, Mike Walsh, BS. He's our uh, former flight school guest. He's now flying F-15s at an Air National Guard squadron. And he said they just do everything digital. I don't think they even have physical logbooks anymore. And then I asked Casmo, our friend uh, from the Low Level Hell podcast, who flew Army Helos, and he said they just use different columns. So it didn't matter the color of the ink. They just put it in a certain column if it was combat or night vision goggles or whatever. So anyway, good question, Adam. Next, let's take a phone call from one of our Patreon supporters. Hi, Jello. It's Jevo in Ontario. I'm really enjoying the podcast, and I have a question for the show. If you Google Tomcat wall of water, the result is a picture of an F-14 flying at high speed and only a few feet off the water. In its wake, water is being lifted high into the air above the level of the vertical stabilizers. I'm pretty sure I've seen similar depictions on film, but I think they're all computer generated. And actually, I'm not sure if this picture is real or just a great artist impression. If you fly your jet, fast enough, that close to the water, does this actually happen? If so, do you know anyone who's done this? Maybe some of your Blue Angels contacts. Also, how low and fast do you have to go? And is it some form of exaggerated wake turbulence, or does it have another name or names? Take care and stay safe and well. All right, Jevo. Well, thanks for the question and thanks for your support on Patreon. So I figured I knew this one, but I put it to Guido Bernacchi, our friend from the Blue Angels, who's uh, just about to retire from the Naval Academy. He confirmed what I suspected, which is number one, that picture you're talking about, it's actually a painting and it's a cool one. It's that F-14 kind of coming at the observer low and you just got those two big columns of water coming up. But in reality, what you would have is more of the shock wave coming over the whole aircraft. And you've seen this in high-speed flybys on YouTube where the little cloud kind of flashes observing over the uh, aircraft. Well, that would go down and hit the water and you would just have this line of turbulent water following the aircraft. And in fact, Guido reminded me that if you look back at some of the videos from the Blue Angels over, let's say, the San Francisco Bay during Fleet Week, that you can see evidence of this. It's just that disturbed water kind of following along. But Guido did mention one of the takeoffs the solos do, I think it's number six, is he'll go down, clean up his 
jet real quick, get super fast, and then just suddenly honk on the AOA and point the uh, nozzles down to the ground and raise either a bunch of dirt or a bunch of water, depending on what he's over. And that will give kind of an instantaneous little effect like in that picture, but it's nothing like in the picture. So in reality, it's the shockwave that's going to uh, stir it up. Wang, are you familiar with that picture we're talking about with that F-14 or photo painting? Oh, I totally know that picture of the F-14, like with the mountains in the background and on the lake, and you see these like twin rooster tails coming up behind it. I mean, yeah. It's awesome. It's like aviation history, but I think it's fiction. <laughs> uh, all right. So email from Frayne Smolik. Fighter pilots go through various trainings to become good enough to fly and fight if needed. On missions, pilots calculate in their heads how they will fly and what maneuver they will do to beat the opponent. Is it hard to calculate all these tactics or can you learn it in flight school in which you came as a normal person? How to know if you are good enough for becoming a fighter pilot? Wang, I'll put this to you. I, I guess I, I'm not sure what he's asking, but obviously you aren't just born a fighter pilot, right? You get to a point where you can do these maneuvers, and, and I guess he's wondering, can anyone do them? Yeah, I'm proof that you are definitely not born to do it. And no, to calculate all that <laughs> stuff is really, really hard, right? I mean, again, Jello, you, yeah. you know uh, better than I do. I mean, you have to practice this stuff. Uh, you have to learn the hows and the whys, and then you have to go out and practice it like it's muscle memory. Oh, it's true. Yeah. To Frayne's point, you come in maybe with some flight experience, and we talked about that with you previously on your episode. You come in and you get taught how to fly, how to fight, how to deal with all the different things you need to do. And that's why I'm always harping on how I think fighter pilots and military aviators in general are every bit as professional as all the other occupations people talk about, doctors and lawyers and such. And so it is very busy. And you learn a lot and your learning is never over. Every mission you go out and you come back and you debrief it. And so, yeah, Frank, people learn how to do it. And when you come back from a mission, you say, hey, you know, I did this maneuver. Maybe I should have done that one. So that's what makes you even better the next day. And, and you hope that you can ultimately, when the balloon goes up, as the expression goes, beat your opponent. All right. Well, that will do it for listener questions for this week. Now let's move on to the main event. Now, Wang, you had a chance to listen to this interview in advance, and we know that you have some CAP experience. So we wanted to bring you in to help out with this episode. Any thoughts, big picture wise, before we get to the interview? Civil Air Patrol was one of the, and the experiences here was life-changing for me. Absolutely. I was a cadet and I actually have some experience with both Tater and Cookie. I joined Squadron 87 for a very short time while I was trying to figure out what my plans were, where I was going to live and whatnot back about four years ago. So it was super fun to hear them both on. I stay in touch with Tater fairly regularly over social media. So they're great guys. It's a fantastic squadron and it's an awesome organization. I would not be where I am today, any of the success I've had without Civil Air Patrol. So how's that for uh, right out of the barrel, ready to go? Well, that's as good a preview, I think, as we can get. Why don't we let Tater and Cookie take it away on the Civil Air Patrol? Wouldn't it be great if there was an organization that, as an auxiliary to the United States Air Force, searched for and found lost citizens, provided comfort in times of disaster, worked to keep the homeland safe, and educated and inspired tens of thousands of young people to a life of service? Well, there is. It's called the Civil Air Patrol, and we're going to learn all about it today. Joining me here in studio is Major Roy Knight, California Wing of the Civil Air Patrol. How are you doing, Tater? Doing good. Glad to be here, Jello. Excellent. Well, I'm glad to have you. But you're not alone. We also have First Lieutenant Jerry Camp. He is the California Wing Public Affairs Officer. How are you doing, Cookie? You're doing great, Jello. Thanks for having us. Excellent. Well, you are welcome. And I know we're all excited because I think we've had each other's information for what, over a year? And of course, COVID happened, but uh, we had a change in the schedule with the Top Gun Maverick movie getting slid. So we were looking for content and you guys were ready. So here we are. We're happy to be here, Jello. What a great opportunity. Well, I'm also glad to actually be, no kidding, in a studio again for the last year. We've been recording remotely, but the world is trying to reopen and people are getting their vaccinations. So here we are. So now, Tater, you know the drill. You said you listen to the show. I do indeed. Uh, in fact, I just have one episode left to listen to, uh, and I'm saving it for a special time, and that's <laughs> Lancaster. 
And it's going to be very interesting to sometime in the future to listen to myself yes. uh, on this. So that's uh, well. Don't be surprised if you don't like the sound of your own voice. That is <laughs> very common. And uh, so thank you for that. Now I'm not exactly sure when this will air, but hopefully if we air it in May, then the Lancaster mm-hmm. wasn't that long ago. But at any rate, since you've listened, you know the drill. We need to get to know you. So where's Tater from? Where'd you go to school? What have you done up until now? Well, I'm a military brat. So when you ask a military brat where you're from, that Sorry. is a Pretty big World. question. Okay. Uh, my father was a fighter pilot. Okay. So, therefore, I was inoculated early. I wanted to fly. Unfortunately, my father was lost in Southeast Asia, didn't make it back, but that did not in any way change my direction as far as wanting to fly. But, like many things in, in life, you get headed one direction and the billiard ball will get you off in another direction. And I didn't get to go and serve in the military as I wanted to. I started a corporate career and did that whole thing. But flying was my thing. So I did the civilian route, 150s, 152s, Piper Tomahawks, uh, started flying, got into a Civil Air Patrol squadron, and then from that point on, it's been just a wonderful ride. I'm closing in on 3,000 hours. Most of it has been Civil Air Patrol flying. A lot of that, at least 2,000 of it, has been search in the mountains, either as a pilot or as an observer. I have four distress finds, which is a rare thing nowadays. That means an actual crashed aircraft that I located, uh, that I was part of the crew that located. And I've just really enjoyed the CAP ride. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. I don't know if it's too sensitive for me to ask. Are you allowed to, or willing, I should say, to expand on your father at all? At oh, least, sure. I mean, was it hostile action? or? Yes. My father was a Sky Raider pilot. When you did the oh, segment yes. with George Merritt mm-hmm. on the Sky Raider, that was my father's squadron, oh, wow. 602nd Fighter Squadron, flying out of Udorn. Shot down on May 19th, 1967, missing in action until all were declared deceased in 74. He was recovered about a year and a half ago and brought home. So uh, that was obviously a pretty big deal. Oh, yeah. And by the outstanding people of the Department of POWMIA Accounting Agency, active duty and DOD personnel who go into those places and find our missing heroes and bring them home. And I can't say enough about them. Well, that could be a whole separate show, so we mm-hmm. may have to keep in touch, Tater, and mm-hmm. uh, circle back to that one. All right. Well, thank you, and God bless your family and everyone who's been affected by that. And, of course, we're all the benefactors of his sacrifice. All right, Cookie, how about you? Uh, where are you from? What have you done? And what are you doing now? I'm the oddity of oddities. I am a native San Diegan. All right. Uh, everybody else is from somewhere else that moves here, but <laughs> I was born and raised here, also a military brat. I'm the son of a Master Chief Petty Officer who when I was six years old, was the air gunner on the USS Constellation and put my rear end in the front end of an F-4 Phantom. And I looked around and I said, this is where I want to (laughs) live. So went through uh, school here in San Diego, got a Bachelor of Science degree in aeronautical operations with an emphasis in flight operations from San Jose State. And a lot like Tater, this little movie called Top Gun came out (laughs) and I graduated in 1987. So it diminished my ability to complete my Navy program that I was in during college. Our program officer, said, congratulations, gentlemen, you're all civilians, go have a nice life. (laughs) And so I pivoted and I did a 25-year career in law enforcement with the state of California, uh, one of the three-letter agencies, and had a very nice career. But anybody who you know that works with me will know that aviation was very high on the list. There were flying magazines all over my cubicle and never got away from it. As part of my law enforcement career, went to a Coast Guard orientation and Tater was sitting there with about four other people and saw this watch, which is a Citizen Aviator Echo Drive. And he said, you're a pilot. (laughs) And I said, yes, I am. And he said, you need to come fly with us. All right. So I joined Squadron 87 in Fallbrook almost six years ago. Well, almost seven years ago. Haven't stopped ever since. I'm a low time overall pilot. I've got a little over 200 hours PIC. I have 150 some odd hours as air crewman, either in the right seat as a mission observer or in the back seat as a mission scanner. And I have one non distress find as a mission observer, which means uh, we found a ELT that was going off in a hangar at French Valley Airport. (laughs) And that sums up Cookie. And we'll get to the call signs later. Well, gosh, there's so much here already we could unpack, but let's go back to the very beginning. Now, as I understand the Civil Air Patrol, 
founded its uh, roots, if you will, well, way back, what, in the beginning of World War II type era? So, right before the beginning of World okay. War II. Well, tell us a little bit that led up to what we know of today as Civil Air Patrol, and I think we're, what, closing in on its 80th anniversary. Right. Yes, coming up on the 80th. As the storm clouds were gathering right before World War II, there were some real smart folks who saw the value of the growing, burgeoning general aviation community in the United States at the time. And they thought, well, there's a lot of good that could be done with these folks and their little airplanes. So the Civil Air Patrol was formed and incorporated in on December 1st, 1941, six days before the bombs fell. Mm-hmm. And they were uh, obviously, they were far seeing. From that point on, the Civil Air Patrol has contributed greatly. And during World War II, it was significant from liaison, but the big thing obviously is patrolling and the one that uh, everyone talks about during that time was sub hunting off of the East Coast primarily. While there were two subs that were accounted for as be- having been sunk by CAP, it has since been proven that nope, they were not sunk, but we sure scared them. <laughs> <laughs> and the All point right. of that is just like any other security fence or system, mm-hmm. is the little airplanes patrolling up and down with depth charges and bombs forced the enemy to do things that they would not, they could not just at will move about. And it proceeded on finding other ways that in small aircraft, dedicated volunteers could do good things. Well, and I have to think now to jump ahead, I'm imagining the the, the Civil Air Patrol today isn't necessarily doing kinetic events with uh, weapons. No, darn it. (laughs) (laughs) No, and we don't. There's a, a wide variety and myriad of things that we do from the surrogate predator program where we actually act as the drone with the ball and the whole thing, Mm. or flying uh, in a very important mission where they're called WADS missions, where we go and fly and then the system is exercised to intercept us. And Mm. so it's not just the fighter pilots, but it's the whole thing. And they find us and intercept us and we go through that whole thing, or it could be counter drug, or it could be other Homeland security type missions flying cadets, and there's a wide, wide range of things that that we do. And it's changed over the eight decades, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, like you said, you were doing patrols. Today, I think of at least, and that's part of the reason I'm excited for this interview is I want to learn about it too. But when I think of the Civil Air Patrol, I think of search and rescue Mm -hmm. and other things. But what are some of the historic missions and what are some of the main missions today? We were always trying to meet a need whenever it was. And one of the really cool and esoteric ones that we did was right after Sputnik was launched. We would fly at a certain altitude, trailing on a wire behind the airplane, a light bulb. And it was made by uh, General Electric. General Electric, that's right. Okay. And if you go to the Google, it'll tell you all about it. (laughs) And they would replicate a satellite going over for satellite spotters. So we had trained folks to be satellite spotters for this new threat, you know. Okay. That's one thing. But uh, patrolling, I mean, if you think about it, what you have is an, an airborne platform. People can look and observe or mm-hmm. find. And so what are the uses that you can do with that? And from forest fires to uh, sundowner patrols, ships that are boats in distress, mm-hmm. obviously missing people. The big one, the one that we have done from the beginning, has been search for crashed aircraft, right. military and civilian. Right. And we've been successful with that. What does it mean to be an auxiliary of the United States Air Force? Is there some sort of relationship there? I don't know. Cookie, is this a question for you? Is there control or funding or what does the word auxiliary mean in this case? Well, we're an interesting hybrid. We're a congressionally authorized 5013C charity, so we can accept donations, but the Air Force also funds a certain portion of our budget, approximately $26 $26 million of our budget this year is coming from the United States Air Force. $11 million of that is going to be in appropriating aircraft, and another $1 million will be ground vehicles. You know, even though it says Civil Air Patrol, we also have a ground team component mm-hmm. where we have people who go out on the ground, including cadets, who once we get into an area from the air, we direct the ground teams in to find the survivor or the crash site or 
whatever. And ground teams also have been a big part of our COVID response this past year. And even a bunch of us air crew people have chipped in in the food bank era. We've delivered nationwide close to 7 million meals. In the state of California, over 2.7 million meals have been sent out for those that have needed it during COVID. So getting back to the Air Force thing, We have three different types of missions. We have A missions, B missions, and C missions. A missions are one where we're working with a client which is authorized through the Air Force. It can be the Air Force themselves, like in a Western air defense, what we call a WADS mission, where we're going out and being the target and F-16s, F-15s come out and intercept us. Or it could be us working through FEMA doing fire disaster recovery photography, and that's also a mission, and that's funded through the Air Force. And who we report to in the Air Force is Air Combat Command, First Air Force, the protectors of the homeland. Okay. So we work directly for them, and during in those missions, they execute a certain level of control, not to get too much in the weeds, but we work through the ICS system, the incident command system, the same one that the fire department uses for earthquakes and that kind of stuff. And we come under that kind of command structure. As a matter of fact, we report to First Air Force directly through our chain of command Mm -hmm. in those times. It's kind of a long drawn out answer, but it kind of gives you a, a taste of how we work as the Air Force side of it. As the corporate side of it, We can also do work for local municipalities. One that I think uh, Roy might have touched on briefly is we can fly patrols along the California aqueduct system. Basically, what we're doing is we're looking for people stealing water. And that's through the California Water Project, and we've got an MOU with them. We exchange funds. The short answer is this. It costs approximately $2,500 an hour to launch an HH-60 whether it be an Air Force HH-60, a Navy HH-60, or a Coast Guard (laughs) HH-60. We fly for $165 an hour, and it's just the fuel in the airplane because the people inside were not getting paid. We're just doing it for the flight time and the love of country and love of community. Yeah. Well, that speaks volumes for you. I read in preparing for this interview that you were among the first assets airborne after 9-11-01, providing high-resolution photographs of Ground Zero. Not just that, and we did do that, but there's another mission that was very important that happened the next day, within two days, or over the next two days, and that was we needed to know if our blood supply was adequate and how we could prepare to start accepting blood supplies in order to take care of injured people. Civil Air Patrol aircraft flew test kits from all different parts of And I know in California, I'm not sure about other wings or states, but for example, in our squadron, uh, Squadron 87 out of Fallbrook, two pilots, both Marines, by the way, had been uh, Marines previously, took off in R-182, launched 00, flew direct to Oakland from Fallbrook, and the only other people in the air at that time were fighters. Mm -hmm. That was one of those moments where the risk was worth the effort, Right, and that happened quite a bit. Okay. But getting back to on Ground Zero, the famous shot of the two holes in the ground Mm -hmm. the next day that was taken by a Civil Air Patrol air crew out of New York. New York Wing did a lot in those days doing providing liaison services and patrol services. Like Tater said, everybody else was grounded. So Mm -hmm. we could fly when the rest of aviation was on the ground. Now, describe for me, though, who's doing this. So it's not just folks like our generation, right? I mean, we've got, what, senior members and cadets? What role are the cadets playing in all this? Well, cadets also participate, as Cookie said earlier, in ground teams and that sort of thing. They also help us with ELT search ground team again. Mm -hmm. They don't participate in any search efforts airborne. Another thing regarding who we are and how we are is probably the best example or comparison would be like a local volunteer fire department. Okay. So we're all doing other things in our lives. We have our jobs, our families, and so on. We're not dedicated military folks. We're dedicated emergency services folks. So everything we do is outside of our regular jobs, Mm -hmm. but the same dedication, the same motivation, and we have to get our skill set up to the level where we can do that also. 
But getting back to your question about the cadets, when we do a search and rescue exercise or we do an airborne photography exercise, the cadets are fully integrated into the exercise. They could be out in the field as a ground team Mm -hmm. for search and rescue exercises. Quite a few of the exercises I've worked, the cadets have been mission radio operators. As a matter of fact, about four months ago, we had a airborne intercept mission where the mission radio operator was a cadet. So the age thing, except for, you know, legally, doesn't really matter. We train the cadets for in emergency services to the same level as the senior members, and they have to hit the same benchmarks as well. Mm-hmm. I will say that since I joined this organization, I've worked a lot with one of the local cadet squadrons as their aerospace education officer. These are some of the finest young people I've ever met in my entire life. They are outstanding young women and men and they want to serve their communities and they like going out in the field and doing it. And some of them just like Civil Air Patrol for doing drill and for presenting the flag at Padre games and football games and things like that. But others, they're really emergency services focused Mm -hmm. and they want to go out. They want to do the mission. As you'll see later, these are some of the most outstanding young people you've ever met. Five years ago, there was two cadets and two seniors, and it ended up being one senior and two cadets, led the local San Diego Sheriff's search and rescue team up to a crash site on Vulcan Mountain, and it was the cadets leading the way to that crash site. Mm -hmm. And this was in uh, horrible conditions, sleet, rain, wind, the whole bit, and uh, did an absolutely fantastic job. We have a kind of a joke. tongue-in-cheek saying that we said, Civil Air Patrol, you'll be located by a retired airline pilot and saved by a (laughs) (laughs) 17-year-old. Well, I'm hoping it's great development for them at such a precious age where they're not quite a child anymore, but not quite an adult. When I looked at your website, GoCivilAirPatrol.com, it says the cadet program has developed around five core elements, leadership, character development, aerospace education, physical fitness, and activities. It's not, though, just as I understand now here in talking with you for the last few minutes, it's not just join the Civil Air Patrol and you're going to end up with a private pilot's license or something like that. In fact, you might not get, what, a whole lot of flying, but you are getting the leadership the character development, you're getting real-world experiences out there, and you're leading folks. Tater will talk more about this in detail, but every cadet gets five orientation flights for free, paid for by Civil Air Patrol. Okay. And where, like an Air Force ROTC cadet at San Diego State gets one. But ours get five. There's a curriculum that's followed and that sort of thing. And Tater can really speak to it because that's one of his favorite things to do. It is. So they get the five, they're building block type rides. Okay. And they also get five glider rides. That's one thing that he didn't mention. And a a CAP cadet can end up with a glider license at some point if they can apply themselves. The five rides, uh, first off, I mean, if you have a passion in aviation and, you know, the thing you want to do is to share it. And we have this opportunity with cadets. And the way it works is the ride's fully briefed, of course, and get in the airplane Taxi out, take off. As soon as we're 1,000 feet above the ground and clear the airport area, they're flying the airplane. And they continue to fly the airplane throughout the whole ride, one hour. We land, swap seats, and now the person who had to endure the ham-handedness of the one before (laughs) gets Mm -hmm. to return the favor. It is remarkable. And I can't tell you what a rewarding thing it is to the first time some of these cadets have ever been in an airplane of any kind. Right. And within minutes, they're flying that airplane, the grin. And some are just remarkably, you know, what do you learn and what's innate, you know? Right. And, boy, I'll tell you what, you can see some really tremendous hands in those cockpits. Oh, I imagine. Yeah. I have young people all the time reach out to me because of the podcast saying, what can I do to better prepare myself for military aviation? I say, go get some flying experience Mm -hmm. because you want to know if your brain can handle it, if your stomach can handle it. That's part of the reason also I wanted to learn about the Civil Air Patrol. I remember knowing about it when I was younger. I don't remember why I didn't get involved. Maybe there wasn't a squadron nearby. But at any rate, this sounds like an opportunity for folks to go get roughly five hours, you said, and then a glider. Right. In addition to that, we now have a new flight training program for cadets, and they are actually going all the way through private pilots. We have 172s that we're training in. There's Mm -hmm. one at Gillespie Field right now, flying cadets. They're learning how, getting their license right now. Great. I think 
76 cadets at this point? Se- yeah, 76 cadets. The 76th one just earned their private pilot's license nationwide the other day. Um, you'll be speaking to a cadet that's in the Cadet Wings program okay. and learn all about that from her experience and how she was selected. And so not every cadet qualifies for the Cadet Wings program, but this is the level of dedication that Civil Air Patrol has for the training of future pilots. Mm-hmm. Martha King is on our board of governors. And if you don't know who Martha King is, she's a local San Diego small business person who puts out these aviation videos that teaches private pilot ground school, instrument ground school. She's a fantastic aviator in her own right. She holds every certificate you can hold as an aviator. And she has been recognized by CAP as this is a person we need to have on our team as we train the future of aviation. And so just a a little nod to John and Martha King, but Martha King being on the Board of Governors of CAP. And matter of fact, she's taken that on and her article in Flying Magazine, she's written many articles now about the role of Civil Air Patrol and training cadets and that thing. But getting back to the cadet training, you know, they get a great basis at their cadet squadrons about aeronautical knowledge and that sort of thing. We nurture that by doing the first five rides, you know, where we get them hooked, you know, with the first five free rides. And then now the Cadet Wings program, which is sponsored by the United States Air Force, similar to the Cadet Wings program through Air Force ROTC, where they pick certain cadets to go through the training program. The biggest difference is the Air Force program, fixed-based operators are doing the training. The Cadet Wings program, our in-house flight instructors and our in-house aircraft are taking the majority. Okay. We have dedicated aircraft for that, too. One thing regarding uh, Cadet O-Rides and this being a pathway, one of my experiences and the Cadet that I'm going to talk about, he is exceptional. So there is that. Okay. (laughs) So he's not, he is certainly uh, above and beyond. But I was fortunate enough to give him a couple of his O-Rides, and I gave him his last O-Ride, and he shows up to the O-Ride by flying a 172 from <laughs> to our, our field. You to, figured he'd be okay then. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah he, he did just fine. He is now, I think, this week getting his dollar ride at Euronado Joint Jet Pilot Training at Shepard Air Force Base. Wow after graduating from the Air Force Academy. And the names are not used to protect the active duty. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and that's good. But I want to ask you specifically about that, Tater, because for a young man or woman who wants to ultimately be a military pilot and who maybe listens to this show, apart from the intangible things that you'll learn, it sounds like in the Civil Air Patrol, again, leadership, Mm -hmm. showing up to things on time, being a part of something larger than yourself. Is there anything formal that is going to help your chances? In other words, is the Air Force or Navy, for that matter, going to look at an applicant with Civil Air Patrol experiences getting higher marks when it comes down to selecting? Yes, it is definitely considered. And in fact, 10% of the Air Force Academy, I don't know if it's graduates. Cadre. Yeah, are CAP. Hmm. They got there through CAP or CAP was a factor in their selection. No kidding. But let's say that you, for some reason, not going to go to college, didn't make it to the academy. You go through basic and you've reached a certain level in CAP, you get an extra stripe once you get finished basic. So there's a very tangible sure, aspect to that. But the other part of it is, I think, is that it throws you in, in CAP, it puts you in connection and contact with right. that world. Yeah. You know, sometimes it may be somebody you meet or talk to or form a relationship with that helps you to the next step and so on. Well, plus it exposes young men and women to military discipline, I suppose, but maybe lifestyle. In other words, the young people we're going to speak to here are in uniform. And so they have to know how to wear that and, you know, hold themselves a certain way. And I've got three boys at home. And so I'm constantly reminding them to lift their arms off the table when they eat. <laughs> you know, not, you're not just shoveling it in. You, you want to look like you're, you've got some manners. And so I think I'm guessing there there's an element to that that they're picking up at a young age as well. I hear from the cadets that move on to military careers is Yeah, they go, Lieutenant, I was selected the first week out to be the squad leader or group leader, you know, insert leadership level here at basic training at officer candidate school, whatever, because I knew how to shine my shoes. I knew how to get my gig line straight. I knew how to teach people how to march and do that kind of stuff. So they are recognized even by their uh, drill instructors and their instructors at the different 
say they're going to officer candidate school yes. or one of those, they're recognized, oh, you've been in Civil Air Patrol, and they can tell by when they walk through the door how they carry themselves that you've been there, done that, that's got right. part of the T-shirt, let's put you in a leadership position. Yeah. Can we go back, and I forgot the name of the program, but real quick, the pathway that leads to them getting a uh, private pilot's license? Wings. It's the, the Cadet Wings program. Cadet Wings program. So if a normal person goes down to an FBO to get a private pilot's license, I don't know what it is these days. It used to be $10,000. It's probably quite a bit more. Uh, it's in that neighborhood. Yeah. Is it? Okay. Yeah. So, But for a young cadet, is that something where... Is it paid for or is it just at a discount? Are there scholarships or how does that work to get the Cadet Wings program? If they're brought into the program, their whole program is paid for. That's amazing. Yeah. There are opportunities for cadets through outside of that program to use Civil Air Patrol aircraft and Civil Air Patrol instructors to get their private pilot's okay. license and to contribute towards it. The great thing about Civil Air Patrol is, and I have used and borderline abused this privilege, <laughs> which is while flying in a civil air patrol aircraft, the flight instructor sitting in the right seat costs you nothing. Ah, uh, yes. So I recently came back from a medical situation where I didn't fly for close to four and a half years. So the flight instructors in Squadron 87, which are phenomenal, got me back up to speed and got me back up to flying status after I got my medical back. But a similar way the cadets can do that, that's kind of outside the Cadet Wings program, mm -hmm. but the Cadet Wings program is the one that is actually sponsored, paid for from soup to nuts wow. from the United States Air Force. That's great. Are there some maybe famous people that the listeners might recognize their names that used to be Civil Air Patrol at one point or other? Well, we compiled a little bit of a list. Colonel Eric Allen Bowe, who's an astronaut and a test pilot and okay. flew on space shuttle STS-126 and 133 as a pilot. Okay. Colonel Nicole Melikowski, she was the first female Thunderbird pilot. All right. And she was a cap cadet. Okay. Lieutenant Colonel Shauna Kimbrell, she was the first African-American fighter pilot in the United States Air Force. She is still currently an active CAP member and takes cadets on right. O-Rides. She's a very cool individual. She spoke to our California Wing Conference, virtual conference that we had this past year. Okay. Then we have a current active duty Air Force captain, Captain Julio Cosmo Glick. He was named USAF Forbes 30 under 30 to watch. And in 2018, he was the Air Force Times Airman of the Year. He helped the immigrant population in Qatar on his off hours while he was deployed. Wow. He's helping citizens out there. And he's also working towards a better understanding of civilians to the military. Some notable people that people might have heard about was uh, William Lewis Randolph, who's the founder of Krispy Kreme. You can tell I've probably indulged in his company a little too much. And and Richard Yingling, who's the founder of Yingling Brewery oh. back in Pennsylvania, okay. then wasn't a cap cadet, but is just really worth mentioning. Willa Brown was the first uh, CAP African-American pilot during World War II. Oh, wow. And the thing about Civil Air Patrol during its entire history, skin color, your gender has played no factor, even in World War II. Women and men and people of color have had equal opportunity to rise to the highest heights in Civil Air Patrol. And then one uh, final person is the author, Dale Brown, is a very active Civil Air Patrol member. So not people that you can go, oh, yeah, I saw him on TV or, or whatever, but very notable sure. people in aviation and very notable people. Well, that's good. That's quite a list. Now, for a cadet wannabe, I don't know how else to put it, is there an application process or if you can show up to the meetings and sign up, you can be in? A good place to start would be the Gold Civil Air Patrol website that you just described. Mm -hmm. And there's a unit locator there. You can find the unit closest to you, reach out to them, find out when their meeting nights are. And I would also encourage everyone, whether young people aspiring to be cadets or seniors who would like to fly, just start searching the internet and finding out about us best thing is to go and uh, visit a squadron while they're meeting and doing their activities and so on. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it's a cadet or senior member. You have to come to three meetings okay, so that you can see what we're about and we can see what you're about, see if it's going to be a good fit for you. Sure. Then after three meetings, if you want to join, you go through the application process. 
Just about anybody can join the Civil Air Patrol, whether it's a senior member or a cadet. The cadets go from there, and the cadets progress through the ranks, similar to the Air Force. They start with a airman and go all the way up through what we call SPAS cadet, which is a cadet colonel or a cadet lieutenant colonel. Oh. Those SPAS cadets are the cream of the crumb. They're the top of the top. There's been a very limited number, and I really wish I'd researched this number. <laughs> um, I think it's 370 some odd spots cadets only since the beginning of... Oh, wow. and For 80 years. Right. And mm-hmm. so if you get there and you decide to enlist in the Army, the Air Force, or the United States Coast Guard, you get to move up to E3 when you graduate from okay. basic. That's one of the things, but a lot of the SPAS cadets move on to college, move on to the military academies and that kind of stuff. So a cadet, lieutenant colonel, and they're the ones who run the meetings, the cadets. So the hierarchy of the squadron is that the senior members are there to advise the cadet leadership, but mm-hmm. the cadet cadre runs the meeting, similar to the way it works at the military sure. academies. And the promotions within the cadet ranks, I'm guessing that's not just based on, oh, you've been here a year, so we're going to promote you. It's performance. Everything is earned. Those cadets that you're about to see, every ribbon they have, their rank, everything about it, they earned it. You're talking about uh, leadership and those kinds of things and what the takeaway is after having been in CAP. That's a big part of it. Sure. So, How much time can a Civil Air Patrol cadet expect to spend, whether it's weekly, monthly? Is it a huge commitment or can you do it kind of casually? How how much time? That's actually probably a better question for the cadets, but a meeting generally is once a week. It generally lasts two to two and a half hours, depending on the squadron and depending on what's going on. But there's always something else. So if the squadron is really focused on emergency services, the senior squadrons generally exercise one weekend every other month or every month. They come out with us and they do the emergency services exercise. If they are a squadron that really concentrates on drill and drill competition and that sort of thing, then they'll have additional time on the weekends and stuff like that where they practice their drill and practice their flag folding skills. And the drill competitions are phenomenal because they get American history in there. They learn how to fold the flag. They learn how to take care of the flag. They learn about really how to get their uniforms like spot on. Then there's a physical fitness aspect to it where they have to uh, run a mile in a certain amount of time and mm-hmm. they uh, sit ups, push ups, that whole thing. And that's on the drill side. And it builds camaraderie because they're all trying to do it. And luckily, here in San Diego, Squadron 47, that used to be stationed out of Camp Pendleton, is now in Oceanside, has been the wing drill champion and has gone on to national drill just in the last few years. And obviously, COVID is, we can't really do drill very well on Zoom. (laughs) So, you know, that's the kind of things that they can expect. How many uh, squadrons are there, let's say, in California? And I don't know if that's a good proxy for other states, but if a young person lives uh, in a big city, is there fairly certain that there's going to be a squadron? And if you live... There should be. There's 1,400 squadrons across the United States. Okay. One thing about squadrons that I want to point out is that there's actually three kinds of squadrons. So There is a senior squadron, which is basically all seniors. There's not a cadet component. There's a composite squadron, which has a senior component and a cadet component. Uh Uh-huh. And then a cadet squadron, which is basically all cadets with senior leadership. So the senior squadrons, which is basically where I've been my whole CAP career, that's more the ES flying organization. Okay. And then we support the cadets through O-rides and and other things. A lot of times it has to do with, you know, location and and that sort of thing. Right. You know. We have 78 squadrons. 78. 82 total units when we count subdivisions of the wing. In California Wing, we have 72 single-engine aircraft, three gliders. Mm. Unfortunately, no balloons in the state of California. The New Mexico Wing has a balloon. Currently, as of last Friday, we have a total membership of 3,047. 1,770 of those are senior members, and 1,277 are cadets. Mm. Nationally, we have just under 54,000 members, 32,000 are senior members and 20,000 are just over 20,000 are cadets wow. nationwide. And this isn't unique to the United States. Aren't there comparable organizations in other countries? 
Yes, there's the Air Cadets in Great Britain. Matter okay. of fact, one of our squadrons here locally got on a Zoom call this past summer with oh, the fun. Air Cadets in England and with the time zones and everything. It was quite a logistical <laughs> feat. Yeah, sure. But the Air Cadets in England were rather astonished with the amount of things that we're able to do in the United States versus what they do drill. They have the association with the RAF. They have banned which we don't have. (laughs) They do all of those things, but they don't have the close relationship where the cadets get to go aboard Air Force bases and things like that. And sometimes during special cadet activities, they get C-17 rides and rides in CH-47s and and HH-60s and things like that. Canada and Australia, I know. That's also correct. Air cadets, yes. Good. What does the future hold for the Civil Air Patrol? More of the same? Is there any word of maybe newer, different airplanes or more funding or maybe less funding, God forbid? Well, let's hope that's not the case. We're a pretty good deal uh, right now. We're always trying to find a better way to serve. And we've been doing a lot of that here in California Wing. We've gotten a better, or I shouldn't say better, but a different close relationship with Air National Guard and some of the efforts that they're doing. There's also CAL FIRE, uh, firefighting aspects. Not that we fight fires, but we go in and sure. survey Provide after. And we've uh, transferred radios at one point. We've transferred search dogs. We've done a lot of things. So finding the best way to serve our community and nation. Mm-hmm. The equipment that we have, by the way, I should point out, is I think we're down to five round dial 182s. Everything else that we have are G1000. We have turbo 206s and 182s. Mm-hmm. They're very well maintained, right up to the minute, quality and technology aircraft. Wow. So, you know, there is that aspect as well. And we're flying, we have fly FLIR. We fly uh, a thing called Waldo, which allows us to do a two or three dimensional image depiction over the area that we fly, which you can see the obvious uses for that. Mm-hmm. Looking for better ways to serve always. The SAR business has declined dramatically, thank God, due to technology. Yeah. Uh, so, But we still train to that because there will be the time when we have to go do that. Yeah. So. Well, so far this year, Civil Air Patrol has saved 60 lives in 2021. And that is mostly in response to our cell phone forensics team mm. and our radar forensics team, which is using software that Civil Air Patrol members have developed to locate the last ping on somebody's cell phone. Right. This was a story from a few years ago. A, a family went off-roading in the snow near Reno, and uh, they busted an axle on their Suburban when they were out going around. Mm-hmm. And they were reported overdue by their family, and the cell phone forensics team located their last ping on their cell phone, coordinated that. The Nevada Wing launched an aircraft, found them in their Suburban, and the Sheriff's Department came in, flew in, and rescued them. And go. that's exactly the kind of thing that we want to do and we want to keep doing. So yeah. the mission keeps going. The technology keeps getting better. Yeah. And maybe uh, the people who go on your website, I'm going to give you a geek stick with a bunch of pictures on it. <laughs> uh, there's a really good picture that I want to point out to you in there taken during the fires of a 182 and hard IFR in the smoke. And the windscreen is glowing completely red and it has nice. the G1000 flat screen, primary flight display and multifunction display that's showing up there. And You guys are like, holy cow, you guys flying that? It was completely safe when that picture was taken, but it shows the level of dedication to the flying. And just like to point out, a lot of our flying for search and rescue is done at 90 knots at 1,000 feet. So our pilots are well-trained, and I'll sing Tater's praises. He's one of the toughest guys on mission pilots. When you go up for your mission pilot rating, when you're flying 90 knots, a thousand feet and something goes wrong with the airplane, you don't have a lot of time to figure it out before you're finding a place to land. And to his point on that, you know, a lot of people are learning how to fly. And then once you've done uh, lunch at Big Bear and you've made the trip to Oshkosh and Mm -hmm. what am I going to do now (laughs) (laughs) if you're not a professional pilot? So This is an opportunity to not only give back to your community and nation, but it also stretches you out quite a bit and has you doing things that you're not used to doing. If I said to you as a military pilot, we're going to take and go single engine in the mountains at night, 
you're probably not going to be thrilled with that idea. And that's what we do. Mm. You know, we do things like that yeah. safely. <laughs> but it's still, there's, there's an exposure there. And there's skills that you learn to do that that uh, you don't learn as a private pilot going to have the $100 hamburger. Mm. So. To Tater's point, there's the other aspect. There's the social aspect of Civil Air Patrol. And, and if I could speak to that just sure. for a second. Let's talk about my situation. A little over six years ago, I'm retiring from a law enforcement career. I have a hiccup in my medical, and I'm not flying at all. I'm going to say it. Because of the love and support of my aviation posse mm-hmm. at Squadron 87, I am an airplane owner. I'm working on my instrument rating. I'm working on how I can contribute more to Civil Air Patrol and emergency services, more than just being the guy in the right seat or the gib, the girl or guy in back. Mm-hmm. And these people have really nurtured me. They've helped me. They've really brought me along being able to utilize civil air patrol aircraft that I paid for. But when I can take out the Cessna 182 out of Fallbrook for basically $110 an hour with (laughs) gas and everything, Mm -hmm. and one of the local FBOs is charging $210 an hour for the same aircraft, it really helps you know, financially, sure. since I, all my flying's completely out of pocket, and boy, does my wife, the CFO, <laughs> keep me on that. Yeah, It's really helped me get to the place where I can own my own airplane, and my wife and I are planning on traveling the western United States on our 182Q. Oh, fantastic. All right, my last question then is, we talked about how young people can find out more information and possibly sign up, come to some meetings. What if there's someone out there who's in their 30s or 40s and maybe wants to either participate in some manner, depending on what skills they have, or, hey, you know, I don't have the time, but I'd like to make a contribution. I think you said earlier, Cookie, it's a 501C, right? That's correct, 501C. Well, that 30 or 40-year-old person or any age, for that matter, Mm -hmm. you don't have to be a pilot, first off. Okay. So you would do the same thing the cadets would do. You'd find the unit close to you and right. go and visit. You do the three uh, meetings, learn as much as you can about it. Then everybody takes a look at each other and decides if this is going to be a good fit or not. You also, as an adult, you have to, when you put in the application process, there is a background check that is done on you. Uh-huh. We protect our cadets good. very, very closely and also our organization. There's a lot of money <laughs> riding sure. around out there. Sure. But then once you come in, let's say you're not a pilot, but you've always wanted to fly, you can come in and you can start training right away as a mission uh, scanner. Hmm. So the pilot is the person who puts the aircraft and the crew in a position where they can see the target, find the person, find the aircraft, or take the pictures or whatever. So that person in back, that mission scanner, is vital. Hmm. You can work up to it if you have a little bit more skills already built in, you can become a mission observer. That's doing the same thing, but also helping the pilot with navigation, radios. We have uh, direction finding equipment when we do have a ELT going off and you know, being able to do all of that sort of thing. So there is a lot to do. The mission radio operator, if you don't want to fly, that's vital. The mission-based staff. Being the numbers guy, we have the largest privately owned VHF radio net in the country, and it gets exercised on a weekly and monthly basis by the Air Force and our mission radio operators keep that up. We also have finance people. We have logisticians, logistics people. We'll talk about call signs in a minute. And, yes, uh, and you know, there's a bunch of different jobs out there for people. We have people who act as our maintenance managers for our aircraft Currently, uh, one of the people in our squadron who does the maintenance is a guy who built his own airplane, is a member of EAA on top of everything else. There's a ton of different jobs. We have chaplains, Hmm. you know, and you don't necessarily have to be ordained to be a chaplain, but they act as a character development officers for our cadets and our wayward senior members. So there's a lot of different jobs. Uh, There's one other thing we did not mention, and that is the drone program, the SUAS. That's Uh, true. We have more than anybody. We've got the largest SUAS, according to the... 1,944 drones are owned by the Civil Air Patrol, and we're incorporating those into emergency services. And one of the cool things about that is, and there's a lot of different ways that it can be used, but one of them is when that ground team is down in the gorge, one of the missions we do is fly an airborne repeater so that people way down deep can Mm -hmm. hit the repeater and hit the base uh, with radio. But also... If they're down in the gorge, they can launch the drone, go rather than having to go down that next 
records, they can send the drone down. Sure. And so there's lots of different uses, uh, security aspects and things. Well, I know we have a couple of young people who have been waiting patiently to <laughs> try out these microphones and tell us their experiences. Why don't we go to them? But before we do, like you said, Cookie, you know the drill. we got to go through some call signs. So I'll start with you. How did someone come up with Cookie for Jerry Camp? Well, first I have to say I had a really cool call sign when I was on the High Tech Crimes Task Force. Uh-huh. And I joined the squadron, and these guys said we were going to have none of that. Because, ah, <laughs> Just be- like the real service. Because uh, <laughs> all eight of the call signs I've had in my life, I've picked none of them. But when I was at High Tech Crimes Task Force, I was Warpath, which we were all X Men. And as you right. met me, I'm six foot three. I'm That's a big guy. Too cool, though. And yeah, it's too cool. <laughs> Roy recruited me in, into the squadron. My fourth meeting, I cooked chili for the entire squadron. And then I started cooking at all of the Sarexes and have had everything from beef brisket to pulled pork to a bunch of other things. So uh, squadron commander after Roy deemed me cookie, as in the cook on the trailhead with the covered wagons. Uh, and I hate it, but I try it like hell to live up to it. <laughs> and I can say, for all of his talents, cooking is his best. Oh, well. <laughs> he is really good. <laughs> well, I'm not sure what that says for the other talents yeah, there, exactly. Cookie, but at any rate. All right. Well, uh, Tater, we'll finish with you. How did someone come up with Tater for Roy Knight? Well, it's not as exciting. Basically, the squadron that I was in previously was up in uh, San Bernardino, San Bernardino Squadron 5. And what we're talking about before as far as the group, uh, the squadron, and uh, the camaraderie and the You know, after you go out there and fly some of that stuff together for a while, you get real close. Mm -hmm. And so we would extend it and go on the weekends and head to the river and do that whole thing. So we were at Catherine's Landing, had a boat on the end of the dock, and there were like four guys down there, and it's a floating dock. As I walked down there, the dock started to sink. So the guy said, hey, you need to lay off the steak and taters. (laughs) And that's that's how it happened. (laughs) Yeah, it's always something. All right, gentlemen. Well, wow, this has been a lot of fun and an hour just zipped by, by the way. But I had no idea the Civil Air Patrol was involved with so many amazing things with such great people. And it sounds like a really worthwhile cause. So I hope folks that are listening will either get involved or maybe make a contribution or at the very least be more mindful and appreciative of the types of institutions that this country has that, you know, it's ones like this that I think ultimately make us great. So I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Jello. This has just been awesome. All right. Well, as Tater and Cookie recommended, we've got a couple of young cadets here who are going to fill in a few more blanks. Now, I don't even know your names, but I'll start with you. What's your name? I am Cadet Second Lieutenant Caitlin Winkleblick. Okay. How old are you, Caitlin? I'm 15. You're 15. Awesome. And we also have another young man, and I don't know your name either, but if you can introduce yourself. I'm Cadet First Lieutenant Brenton Wheeler, and I'm 17. Brenton. Okay. Now, how long have, Caitlin, I'll start with you. How long have you been with the Civil Air Patrol? I joined in August of 2018, so almost three years. Almost three years. How about you, Brenton? I've been in uh, since 2017. I joined in September. And so we learned a little bit about cadet ranks. So what is your cadet rank, Brendan? Uh, I'm in the the third phase of the cadet program. So there's four total. Uh, I'm in the leadership phase. I'm right in the middle, uh, right before I hit captain. So I'm a first lieutenant. So right in between where uh, Lieutenant Winkleblack is and uh, almost to the end of the third phase. All right. And so what's your rank? I'm a cadet. Second lieutenant is the first officer rank that you get in Civil Air Patrol, okay. and I just got it February. Oh, great. All right, so you've both been there three, four years, sounds like. What do you like about it the most? Let's start with that. I first joined because I was interested in going to the academy, and okay. so I know nothing about the military. <laughs> um, so I joined, and I found out about emergency services, and that was my favorite thing for the first year. Mm-hmm. But once I took my orientation rides, I fell in love with aviation. So. Great. Cool. Is that what you hope to do maybe after the academy? Yes. All right. How about you, Brandon? The first thing that interested me for Silver Patrol was the emergency services and the leadership aspect. Mm-hmm. My focus has remained the same throughout my four years in the program. Uh, very dedicated to the, the leadership aspect, just developing myself and helping to develop others to lead in a better way. Mm-hmm. That's been my goal for the past four years, uh, but also in the emergency services area. Uh, I think the idea of finding and helping someone is the best thing I can do. So that's why uh, Civil Air Patrol has been the best fit for me. Absolutely. Now, I asked them a question that they said I should ask you, so I'll start with you. How much time do you spend doing this, whether it's by the week or by the month? 
Well, it depends on uh, what position you have mm-hmm. in, in your squadron. As a basic cadet, you'd go for two hours every Thursday or wherever your squadron meets. Mm-hmm. For me, it's every day. I'm always communicating with different people. I'm writing emails and picking up phone calls. It's not a nine to five, but it's whenever it happens. Sure. So it's consistent, but I enjoy what I do. Right. So it just makes it all worthwhile. How about you? How much time do you spend, Galen? I spend roughly every day, but not as much as Lieutenant Wheeler, probably, because I hold a a position in my squadron that I need to be on top of things that help make the schedules, and I go with promotions, so I just have to make sure I'm sending emails to the correct people and making sure everyone's on track. So if you're spending that much time, do either of you participate in other activities like sports or band, or does this kind of consume the free space, if you will? Do you play any sports? Yes, I do cross-country swim and water polo. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully not all at the same time. No. (laughs) All right. And you find time for all of that. Okay. How about you? I do football, basketball, baseball, and track. (laughs) So, yeah, a lot of sports. All Americans in here. Oh, my goodness. All right. Uh, Let me ask you this. What would you want a young person who might be out there hopefully listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast who's thinking about either joining the Civil Air Patrol or or someday the military? I guess you can't really answer that one if you haven't been there, but let's limit it to the Civil Air Patrol. What would you want them to know? Like as the as the senior member said before, you know, just come check it out. You know, mm-hmm. I I'm in my fourth year in this program, and I'm still learning new things that I have the opportunity to do. So it's an amazing program. So many opportunities. You get to meet amazing people every day. Mm-hmm. You get to go places that I would have never gone if I wasn't in Civil Air Patrol. And the opportunities that you have are just there's just so many of them. What about you? What would you say to uh, maybe a young lady that's listening and is inspired by you? So I was originally a Girl Scout, and then I was debating if I should keep on that track or go to Civil Air Patrol. And so I chose Civil Air Patrol, and I do not regret it. And I'm pretty sure anyone who's listening won't either if they Mm -hmm. join, because it's not just leadership. You get to learn about drill and aerospace and camaraderie. You get to go places, Mm -hmm. go for weeks, and just learn new things. Cool. Does either of your high school have a junior ROTC? No. No. Mine doesn't. I wanted to ask if you could compare it or contrast it at all, but if you don't have it, maybe you're not as experienced with that. Well, gosh, so let me ask you, what do you hope to fly if you get a chance to get there and and make it? I've been all over the place. I originally wanted to fly cargo because my mom's friend did, and he said it was a lot of fun, but not anymore. Then I want to become a fighter and a fighter jet, Uh but now I'm kind of interested in being a drone pilot instead of, I'm still looking at my options. Well, a lot will change in the next seven years or so before you uh, get to that point. Also, as I always tell young people who reach out to me, is you might want one thing and you might get something else. So you have to be prepared to walk your own journey and follow that because it's not going to be like anyone else's. It's not going to be like mine. Yes. How about you? I'm one of the few cadets who actually don't want to be a pilot after a Civil Air Patrol. I want to be a combat medic in the Air Force. Oh. So that's why emergency services is um, mm-hmm. one of the big things in Civil Air Patrol. That's what's helping me. I love flying. The opportunities that I've been given by Civil Air Patrol and the O flights is just, it's amazing. I love it. Uh, If I have the opportunity, I will get my private pilot's license, but to fly in the military is not in my... uh... Well, but you do have a goal and that's great. And so all these traits that we talked about before, leadership, character development, aerospace, education, physical fitness, I mean, these are all still applicable to a combat medic. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Well, thanks very much for your time and I want to wish you both the best of luck in your pursuits and in Civil Air Patrol and... Really enjoyed getting to know you both. Well, thank you for having us. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, wow. Thanks again to Tater and Cookie and those fine young cadets. Wang, this sounds like an incredible organization with some really amazing folks doing important missions. Yeah, it really is. All those missions that they talked about, at least the main areas, you know, aerospace education, cadet programs, and emergency services, those have existed forever. They were there when I was a cadet back in the 80s. They continue today, and and they even have additional facets like Tater uh, and Cookie had spoken about. And it's really cool to see them evolve as uh, requirements and maybe even, dare we say, missions evolve. Well, and I wrote down a couple of them as they went over them. I mean, fire spotting, moving food and blood, doing drones, protecting aqueducts from water theft. That's interesting. Search and rescue, of course, is kind of the bread and butter we all think about. And then, uh, if I didn't already say it, a bunch of work they're doing with drones. It's really impressive. Drone stuff was really interesting to hear. I'd love to learn more about that, as well as Mm. the, what was it, cell phone forensics? Yeah. When they were looking for people in the mountains, and they found that family that was 
I forget where they were. I remember hearing about that story in the news where this family was out driving around in the snow and got stuck. And I had no idea this blurb show was involved with finding them. No, they were up north of uh, Fallon. They were in Lovelock. I was back in Fallon at that time, and I remember hearing about it. And it was a good happy ending, of course, that they were found. But yeah, I didn't realize the Civil Air Patrol was involved in that either. That's good stuff. Yeah. Cool. Well, you obviously had some experiences in this. And I guess I wonder if you had a chance to listen to those two young cadets. What amazing young people. But was that your experience? Did you find it kept you busy, but you learned a lot? And how would you say it helped you when you went into the Marine Corps? First off, I'm so glad that you had cadets on because that's really where I related to. I I was a cadet. I did it for about six or seven years and absolutely loved it. And the more that I advanced through ranks and got more responsibility and learned more, it really began to take more time from junior high all the way through high school. I may have still been doing it when I was in junior college before I left to go away to college. Awesome. Now, are you involved any now as a senior member? I mean, it's something I feel like I should get involved with because I'm just so impressed with what they do. I am not up here. I've been busy flying and getting my family settled. It seems like I should be settled already, but a uh, new community <laughs> living in the country, it's been a challenge and there isn't a squadron that's close by. I know where there is one down in Portland and it looks great. I am just spinning too many plates right now, but I would really look forward to getting back involved with them again cadet programs, emergency services, aerospace education, like all three mission areas. I'd love to do it. Yeah. Well, I'm just so glad to have, like I said, institutions like this. For those who can help or just want to make a contribution, go civilairpatrol.com. Really, it sounds like it's making a difference. I mean, you always look at the Joneses, right? Isn't that the expression? I look at that young man who was sitting across from me. Uh, I don't have daughters, but I'm equally proud of her. But I think, man, I have a 17-year-old and uh, I'll refrain from saying anything pejorative of my own child. But I think, well, this kid's squared away. So I think he'll do well as I think he wanted to be a combat medic. So Jello, the people that I met in Civil Air Patrol, some of us were still very close friends. I started two companies with one of my good buddies in Civil Air Patrol, one of them I'm doing right now, in addition to my flying gig. Nicole Malakowski, who Cookie was talking about, she and I were cadets together at the same time. She was actually a Nevada wing cadet, but we saw each other at a lot of California wing events. Oh my gosh, the people that are doing successful stuff right now in the military and in business, a lot of them have a Civil Air Patrol background. And I won't target any of them right now, but man, there's a great network of folks out there that are former cadets that is just really cool yeah. to have crossed paths with them, quite frankly, back when we were kids. Well, that's good. And I also loved when they talked about that it doesn't matter, man or woman, boy or girl, black or white, or any color in between. I mean, it really depends on, hey, show up, contribute, and uh, let's get it done. And I, I wish the rest of the world would go there. But at any rate, All right. Well, what were some of your other experiences in the Civil Air Patrol wing? You know, reading the notes from Cadet Hall, Hunter Hall there, that really took me back. Oh, yeah. Our intro. Yeah. Really took me back to uh, just some great nostalgia, things that I would have never been able to do except for the fact that I was a Civil Air Patrol cadet where I was when I was. It was awesome. But a couple of those things, dependent state crews on the USS Abraham Lincoln back in the early 90s. I think it was a brand new ship. It had that new aircraft carrier smell to it. <laughs> we loaded up about 20 cadets with an, like another three or 4,000 dependents out of uh, NAS Alameda, which is, I think, condominiums now. Yep. Cruised out under the Golden Gate Bridge, went out into the Pacific Ocean, had an air show, F-18s, A-6s, S-3s, drop bombs, shot stuff, shot bullets into the water. I mean, it was amazing. And they let us on the flight deck oh, yeah. during catapult launches. I mean, it was having been there as a naval aviator, realizing the last place I want to be, if I don't belong there, is on the deck of an aircraft carrier. The thought that I was there <laughs> as a 16-year-old sitting on a bunch of ground support equipment, watching airplanes take off and land in front of me seemed absurd. And it was the coolest thing I had ever done up to that point, And probably the coolest thing I'd ever done until I actually landed on an aircraft carrier myself in a T-45. Nice. Yeah, Abraham Lincoln Dependent State Cruise was amazing. Working at the Moffat Air Show and the Watsonville Air Shows when we were cadets, you'd see the Civil Air Patrol cadets. They're at every air show, right? They're doing crowd control. They're minding the line. They're in uniforms. They're doing color guard events. All of that. I ate all that stuff up. With Hunter talking about encampments, oh my gosh. A lot of people think about you know when I went to boot camp or when I went to officer candidate school. 
My first experience with that was Vandenberg Air Force Base Cadet Basic Encampment. We ran our own program for about a week, and it was get up early, shine your shoes, make your bed, learn about military and Air Force history. We toured an ICBM silo, obviously dormant in Vandenberg. Wow. Just so cool. And then coming back a couple of years later, for me, to McClellan Air Force Base, where I was actually in leadership, and I had a flight of young basic cadets that I was sort of taking through the paces. Completely awesome experience. Before I ever got to officer candidate school in Quantico, I knew how to march. I knew how to uh, polish boots and shoes. I knew how to get yelled at. Uh, I knew how to stand in formation and get inspected uh, and all that stuff. So just fantastic experiences. And then the last thing, you know, Tater and Cookie talked about orientation rides. And the squadron that I was in in the Bay Area, West Bay Composite Squadron 192, we had seniors and cadets. We had two airplanes. We had a Cessna 206, which is like the family truckster, the off-road truckster of the Cessna line, albeit piston engine. Then we also had a T-34 Mentor, hmm. like the T-34 that you and I flew yeah. in Pensacola, uh, except it was a piston engine airplane and not a turboprop. But I got to ride. That was my first airplane I ever ridden in that had a canopy that I was sitting you know, front to back with a stick and throttle. It was the coolest thing. Oh, yeah. All of those capabilities still exist today. And gosh, it just takes me back. And it's just like, I love it. I love talking about Silver Air Patrol. I love talking about those experiences. And I love seeing cadets now that are just as excited as ever. And that it's still a great program. So thanks so much for having us on. Thanks again to Hunter for his email. For sure. Okay. Well, that's so cool. And again, I, for me, it was just great to learn about the Civil Air Patrol. And as we were driving away from the studio that day, I bumped into him again and out in the parking lot. And I said, hey, if you guys are ever looking for someone to come talk to one of your meetings or just, you know, be a guest speaker or something. And I couldn't even finish the sentence. Their eyes got real big, like, yes, you know, we're going to have you out. So I look forward to uh, being more involved with those guys. And I think it's also worth pointing out what Tater talked about at the beginning is that as this episode airs in mid-May of 2021, we're just less than a week from the anniversary of him losing his father to hostile action in Southeast Asia. So once again, uh, our kudos and and respect to all those affected by that, especially flying A1s. Wow. That's just, anyway. All right. Well then, hey, why don't we wrap up? Uh, Before we do, let's thank our new Patreon supporters, including strike leads John Hahn and Austin Wright. We have two new mission commanders, Andreas Erickson and Scott Manning. And we have one new air boss, Pete Bouvier. And the air boss is that highest tier. He gets all kinds of cool perks. And we only have a few of those. So thanks to all of our Patreon supporters, including those five new members. As a reminder, the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guests and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. Wang, thanks for returning to the show and lending us your thoughts on the Civil Air Patrol. We always appreciate having you back, my friend. Thanks for having me, Jello. I appreciate helping out. Thanks for talking about Civil Air Patrol. No worries, man. Well, keep in touch. And as for everyone else, you may recall that our co-host boat is busy training for new equipment at our combined airline. So there will be no Warbird episode this month, but we'll see you in 10 days for an interview about the brave pilots who purposely flew missions trying to get SAM sites to shoot at them so they could shoot back. And it's with a guest you've been asking for for years now. In fact, he's authored some books you probably know, including his first, which was a New York Times bestseller, Viper Pilot. We'll leave it at that and see you next time here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. So long. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Email us at questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com. Or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to follow us on your favorite social media platform and check out our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. For exclusive content and to help support the show, check out our Patreon page. Thanks for listening. Hey, Wayne, you think we should do like a Cessna 182 flyby at the end? (laughs) Totally red, white, and blue. (laughs) That would be cool.